All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for a history of swords and sword fighting in the Middle Ages. Uh, this morning, we're going to explore the history of swords, armor, and fighting techniques from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. And it's led by Dr. Gavin Lawson, who's a professor at Bridgewater College. So uh, all of us who are watching live, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Gavin for joining us here today. Gavin, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. And thanks to everyone listening and watching for uh, the opportunity to talk about this and give you this presentation. I've been studying sword fighting in various forms for almost three decades, and this is a topic I really enjoy. Uh, I really enjoy sharing. So, uh, as Robert said, this is a talk about how swords have changed, how swords evolved over the Middle Ages, and even how they were used in combat, both mass combat and in more uh, tournament one-on-one -on -one type setting. And as usual, the best place to start is the beginning. And so we're going to start with the early Middle Ages, from about 500 to 1,000 Common Era. All right. So first, I want to show you, these are some Anglo-Saxon and Viking reenactors. All right. The Anglo-Saxons were uh, Germanic settlers and probably invaders that moved into around our Celtic Britain um, early in the period. Vikings, of course, are the famous Scandinavian raiders. Uh, and I like to show this picture because it kind of flies in the face of what most people think of when they think of fighters, warriors, knights in the Middle Ages. And that is armor, um, plate armor, plate harness, chain mail, helms that fully enclose the face. And as you can see, that is very much lacking in the reenactors that you can see here. Uh, there are a couple of individuals. Um, you can see one on the right who looks like he's wearing a male shirt. And on the left, you have some uh, reenactors that have male um, coifs coming off of the helmet to protect the face and the neck. Um, but for the most part, these guys were unarmored, and this was the case early in that period. Typically, when you went into combat, you went into combat with your street clothes. If you were lucky, you had a helmet, and the majority of your defense came from the shield that you carried. And the shield was essentially made out of plywood with a, with a metal, uh, a dome-shaped metal boss in the center, and that's where you'd hold it. The metal kept your hand protected, even though the shield could end up being damaged. So why is this? Why don't we see more armor here? Uh, well, the simple reason is it was rare and it was very, very expensive. You didn't get um, armor unless you were a wealthy noble, a chieftain, maybe a thane or a huskarl, one of the, you know, one of the select warriors of your war chief. Um, and for everybody else, you pretty much were just left with a shield. And the reason for this is the early Middle Ages coincides with the fall of the Roman Empire. So Rome was pulling out of Britain, they were pulling out of the European continent, and with that went the infrastructure necessary to mass produce armor and to make it readily available. Now, if your only armor is a shield, you're pretty much constrained to using a single-handed sword as your weapon. This isn't universally true. We know that the Vikings and Anglo-Saxons, for example, did from did at times use two-handed axes. Um, but for the most part, if you fought with a shield and you didn't have a spear, you're using a single-handed sword. And so we have a good example of one that was recovered from a burial at the very top and some very excellent uh, recreations down below. And you'll notice they all share a number of similarities. Um, besides being single-handed, they're about three feet in length. And you notice the, the blades are fairly broad, all right? And the and they have a fairly gentle tip. Okay, so the tip kind of gradually, gradually gentles, um, gradually tapers um, down. Uh, you also notice possibly at the top. Hopefully you can read that, and you can see this in the other swords along the middle. There's a groove. This is called the fuller. Um, now in the past, maybe it still is. Uh, this was erroneously referred to as a blood groove. The idea was when you stab somebody, this is what the blood would trickle through, and that's absolutely false. Um, the fuller was a way to lighten the sword, 
all right? By putting a groove down the center, all right, and raising the edges, you could remove steel, but still keep the blade strong. And that's an important thing to remember. A single-handed sword like this weighed two and a half, maybe three pounds, all right? There's a big misconception that European swords were very heavy, they were very clumsy, they were very hard to use, and that's simply not true. Even our, even the big period great swords, you know, the, the German Zweihanders or the Scottish Claymores that were four and a half to five and a half feet long were at most about seven pounds, all right? So European swords were actually fairly light and very, very, and, and very, very quick to use. And the simple reason is that if a weapon's heavy, it's gonna be slow and in slow that gets you killed. All right, so what we have here during this period are swords that are primarily used for cutting. They certainly could stab, um, but they were designed primarily for hacking and chopping at an opponent. And when you're fighting someone who doesn't have any armor, that works just fine. Now, let's move into the high middle ages. So on or around Battle of Hastings, um, and beyond, we start to see this change. Armor starts to become more common and it starts to become more extensive. So on the right, we have a reenactor um, who is uh, reenacting the Knights Templar. And you can see that he is very, very well protected. He has a full male hauberk with long sleeves. Um, he probably has male leggings that kind of hard to see from this picture. Uh, he has a coif under his helm that protects his neck and his lower face. He have an, even has chainmail mittens um, for hand protection and a helmet that completely encloses the head. Um, even has just the start of plate defenses, as you can see too. He has little cops over the knees and, um, and shin guards, which when you're fighting with a shield is the hardest place to protect. So if you're gonna put extra armor on something. That's one of the places we see armored um, very early on. Over to the left, we see um, a similar kind of thing. We have uh, warriors in uh, chainmail, but they have much more extensive plate defenses. They have pauldrons covering their shoulders. They have van braces covering the forms with articulated uh, elbows, uh, leg, uh, metal legs with um, articulated knees and they're wearing what's called a coat of plates. So this was a heavy leather vest or um, heavy cloth vest that you'd rivet plates to, metal plates to, um, to give you some rigid defense against, um, against strikes. Uh, that's one of the things about chainmail. Chainmail is very, very good at protecting against cuts, um, but it is effectively metal cloth. So it is not good at absorbing the concussive force of a strike. So what, ha what would happen was that um, warriors would wear, and knights and all, would wear a padded jacket called a gambeson underneath, and that would provide protection against crushing type injuries. Um, and then of course, putting rigid plates over it um, achieves much the same effect. All right, so one of the things I wanna, I wanna underscore is just how good this armor was because it directly influences um, the swords we see of the period and the way they were used. You're not gonna wear 70 pounds of metal if it does not keep you safe. And one of the best examples that I know of that illustrates just how good this armor was comes from um, Sir William Marshall, who was an English knight. And the um, example I'm thinking of comes from 1177, and it was a tournament that he fought in France, in Pleurs, France. Um, so a little bit about William Marshall. He was one of the greatest knights in history of England. He was the kind of guy that if you went to a tournament and saw he was fighting, you were like, Okay, I'm going for second place. He was that good. Um, now, thing to think about, thing to remember about tournaments is that the tournaments we typically think of, the jousting at the barrier and the pageantry and the, the, the crowds and the stands, that's a fairly late version of a tournament. The earliest tournaments were more like just battles, you know, battle royales. Um, and they were pretty much free for alls. There were no rules. If two or three knights wanted to jump another guy, totally fine. If you wanted your retainers to drag someone off his horse so you could capture him, 
that was totally fine. Um, they were pretty brutal affairs. And But the thing was, if you defeated a knight, you got his armor, you got his horse, and he had to pay you a ransom. So this is a very, very lucrative. Uh, so not only did he get you fame, not only did he get you training for the battlefield, but it was very lucrative. You can make a lot of money um, doing this. And just to give you an idea of how good Sir William was, in his five years on the tournament circuit, and yes, I did say circuit, so the, they would travel from tournament to tournament to tournament. In those five years, he captured over 500 knights. So this guy was a real thing. He was really spectacular. Anyway, back to the tournament in, Frank, in uh, Pleurs. So, end of the tournament, he won. No great surprise. And, but then when they went to find him, to present him with his prize, uh, they couldn't find him anyways. You know, people were looking around. Have you seen Sir William? No, I don't know where he is, so on and so forth. But they finally did track him down. He was at the blacksmith with his helmeted head on an anvil, and the blacksmith was striking his helmet, trying to knock enough dents out that he could actually pull it off his head. Okay, so let's think about this. Imagine how many times he got struck during that day of fighting, the body and the head, everything like that, to have his helmet dented that badly. Um, and he went on to fight after that. You know, he did, that, that didn't finish his, his tournament career or anything along those lines. So the armor that these people were facing was really, really substantial. And you had, and, a, and the, the swords of the early period were just not going to be as effective. Um, the other thing I think about is, okay, if he was the winner, what must have the loser been? What must have the loser looked like? I mean, I would not want to be that guy. If that's how the, 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 the winner got out. Anyhow, so as armor improved, swords changed as well. A single-handed cutting sword was simply not going to be as effective against a very well-armored opponent. So at this point, we see the appearance of true two-handed swords, or called long swords. These were typically about three, three and a half pounds in length. They were around um, um, four feet long, and a two-handed sword had a great deal of advantage over a single one, obviously. Using two hands means you can strike a much more powerful cut, and you can deliver a much greater concussive force, and you can thrust much, much more powerfully. Now, downside is you can't carry a shield. But if you're as well armored as, say, William, you know, Sir William or something like that, you know, that's fine. All right. You don't need the, the shield anymore. So not only were these swords longer, but they were also changing in terms of their geometry, right? The blades were no longer as flattened. They were more diamond shaped. Okay. That made them stiffer. All right. And they came to a much, much more acute tip. So while they could cut, thrusting was becoming a more important use of the sword, all right? And against a heavily armored opponent, the benefit of that was you might not be able to cut and do much damage against the mail and the plate, the, the, the coat of plates they were wearing, but you could use that tip to stab into areas between plates, in the armpit, in the neck, in the groin, the back of the knee, elbow, places where there wasn't a lot of protection. So we start to see not, again, not just different types of swords, but a different way of using, a different emphasis in combat. And if you look at the period fighting manuals at the time, the German, Italian fighting manuals, you see that a lot. You see thrusting attacks starting to become much, much more common as a way of um, dispatching an, uh, an enemy. Now. This doesn't mean that single-handed swords just faded out of use entirely. Um, single-handed swords were still very effective against a um, poorly armored opponent. They, they stayed in the battlefield for the entirety of the period. But at the same time, we do see some specializations, right? Swords that were single-handed swords better for thrusting. For example, the arming sword you can see down at the bottom. I mean, clearly, clearly a very acute tip, very, very well suited for thrusting, although it can certainly cut. Um, but we also see single-handed swords that were heavier. And the, the idea here was 
to deliver much more of a concussive force, a blow to an opponent that could stun them, stagger them, possibly break something. Uh, this is when we also start to see lots of things. You know, we see things like warhammers, maces, and axes becoming used more frequently. Um, but up at the top, you can see a couple of really nice examples. Uh, the Custille, right, which is a very heavy, you know, chopping kind of dagger or chopping kind of sword, and then a falchion. All right. Um, falchions were interesting because they were single edge. We typically think of European swords as having two cutting surfaces and many and, and most of them did. Um, whereas, you know, we think of like the katanas and the wakizashis of, of Japanese culture being single edge swords. Um, single edge swords were actually fairly common in Europe in the form of a falchion or um, what was referred to as a messer in uh, in German. All right, they had these single edges and the back edge um, was was blunted. You can still strike with it. You know, you can still hit somebody and deliver, you know, deliver a concussive blow with the back of the edge, with the back of the sword, but it only had one cutting surface. Okay, so here we are. We are finally at the late Middle Ages, and we are at what a knight is supposed to look like. Full plate harness, rigid plate defenses. Covering chainmail. Um, the chainmail was important, of course, because as you can see on the knight to the left, um, you're going to have gaps in the plates. You have to have that covered. Um, but these were very, very obviously well armored individuals. And against someone like this, a, even a longsword is going to struggle to do a lot of damage. You are not going to cut through those plates. You are not going to thrust through those plates. Um, so once again, we see. The evolution of a new type of sword, but we also see some very, very new techniques in the way that the swords were used. Okay, so what we have up here on the right is an illustration from a period fighting manual um, showing a technique called half sorting. Now, the individuals, individuals you see here, including the reenactors on the left, they're using typical long swords of the period, but you'll notice that they're not using them in a typical fashion. Rather than two hands on the grip and cutting as you would usually do, they're gripping the blade or the blade and hand guard and turning the sword into a short spear. So this was this was half sorting. And the benefit of this was that it gave you a lot of point control if you went tip forward, all right, like the individual on the right. And this will let you do things like place the tip at a gap in a person's armor, and then use your hips and both hands to thrust into that gap to try to do some damage. You can see in this picture up on the right, he's gotten that tip right at the gap in the helmet and he's driving into the, into the neck. Um, or on the other hand, as you can see the gentleman, the uh, knight on the left, he's using it more as a grappling tool more like a pole arm or a crowbar. He's using the hilt of the sword to get behind his opponent's neck and he's gonna to try to throw him to the ground. And once on the ground, he would finish him off with a dagger, all right? They can easily penetrate eye slots, throats, um, things like that. Um, interesting thing about, about um, combat training in the Middle Ages, wrestling was a very, very important part of this. Um, learning how to grapple your opponent, learning how to throw your opponent, learning how to get them on the ground so you could subdue them. And wrestling in that period wasn't just the wrestling that we think of, the pure grappling techniques. It involved punching, kicking, um, joint locks. If you look at some of the dagger manuals that are out there, um, You'll see a lot of techniques that would not look out of place in a jujitsu school, various arm bars and joint locks and things, things like that. So, so wrestling, in addition to um, weapon combat, was very, very um, important as well. Now, you can see down here on the right, here's our, an example of one of the newer swords that shows up at this, at this period. And this is called the S-Dock. And the S-Dock is essentially a two-handed ice pick. The, Blade has a perfectly square cross section. It has no cutting edge. It's just a giant metal needle that was entirely used for thrust. And this was very, very popular um, when fighting enemy in full plate. You could potentially even drive this between weakened areas of chainmail and so forth. So again, we move, we've moved from cutting 
primarily cutting swords early in the period to ones that are purely for thrusting late in the period. And in some cases, you know, not even used for use as a typical sword would be, but instead used as this spear pole arm um, type combination. And if all else fails, well, why not just turn your sword into a hammer? So we come to the final technique, um, the most specialized and one of the more intriguing ones, the Mothau or Motschlag, the murder stroke. So what you did here was, as you can see, you grabbed the blade with two hands and essentially turned your sword into a war pick. The goal was to strike your opponent with the cross guard or to hit them with the pommel. The pommel is the, is the enlarged um, counterweight at the end of the sword opposite the tip. Uh, the pommel did two things. One, of course, kept your hand from sliding off, but also it acted as a counterweight to balance the blade. Um, these blades were very well balanced. The center of mass typically just a couple inches in front of the hilt, so they balanced very easily, um, which made them much, much faster to use. It didn't take a lot of force to get that tips, to get that blade um, accelerating. Now, murder stroke is kind of interesting. Um, when I was doing some research, getting ready for this talk, and I started looking into what modern reactors think, um, there's some debate as to how commonly this was used, at least with your traditional longsword. And the argument is as follows. So we see these illustrations all over the place. German manuals, Italian manuals, those are the two major schools, sword fighting um, in the Middle Ages. And so we see this all over the place. So it had to have been done. Um, but you'll see the guy down on the right, he's doing it in bare hands, all right, with, with, with bare hands. So the idea is, like, I don't have any armor. I'm fighting a guy with armor. I'm just going to try to wail on him with the end of my sword and hope for the best. So the argument is as follows. You're talking about holding a sharpened sword with your bare hands hard enough that you can swing it quickly and deliver significant impact to your opponent, right? Um, if you've ever tried to grab a sharpened sword, it's not easy to do even when you're grabbing it lightly. I have a I have a sharpened long sword here. Yeah, that ow, that hurts. Um, so maybe with you know heavy leather gloves or maybe if you're wearing chainmail mittens or something like that, but it just seems very strange. You're, it, there's 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 a lot of debate as to whether this was done with your traditional long sword like the one I've got. But we do know it was done. And we know it was done because we find swords that were specifically designed for murder stroke, or at least using that as a potential technique. And I absolutely love these. Okay, so the one left. So this is an S-talk, all right? Triangular cross section, no bladed, no, no edge, tapers down to a needle-like point. You look at the cross guard, you'll see the cross guard has actually been filed down into a point, all right, like a war pick. And the pommel has spikes coming off of it, all right? This was a sword that you could very easily use to deliver a murder stroke, okay, to just start beating on your opponent like you were wielding a mace. We even have some examples of these where there's no blade at all, all right? And what I mean is it's just a tube of metal, you're just a solid rod of metal coming off of the cross guard. Now it tapers to a point, right? You can still thrust with it, but it doesn't have any edge of any kind. And the rest of the, that, the, the bulk of the sword's blade, if you will, was just a big handle you can use to swing it. Um, on the upper right, you can see a couple of uh, examples of swords where there are gaps in the blades. So these are, these are, these are swords where sections of the blade were filed down so there was no edge, specifically so you can grab it with your hand. Um, this could be done for half sorting. This could be done for um, much logging, for, for murder stroke and the like. Uh, and then down at the bottom, we have my favorite example. Now, we don't know if this was ever actually made. This comes out of an Italian treatise from one of the great Italian masters. Um, but I don't think we've ever found an actual copy of it. The, the one you see down there is a replica somebody made. 
And this thing is just wild. So for one thing, you'll notice the base of the sword, down toward the, or the tip of the sword, flares out. Okay, gets very, very wide and then tapers to almost a needle-like tip. We do see that in a number of swords where you're really turning the tip end of the sword into more of a spear point. The cross guard is pointed, you know, nice and sharp, so you can you know, whack somebody in the head with that and try to try to drive it through the through the metal. There are spikes coming off of the pommel. But what makes this one really, really wild is the ring. Okay. So that metal ring that you see was not welded in place. It could slide along the blade. So what that meant was when you were holding it, before you swung, that metal ring was down by your hand. And as you slung the blade around, that ring would slide down and increase the momentum of the swing to maximize the concussive force that could be delivered. So, Swords got really, really, really weird at the end of the period. We even had swords, I, I, I didn't have time to find a good picture of it, that honestly don't really look like swords anymore. They are swords, but there are two cross guards. All right, so there's a cross guard at the pommel end, there's a cross guard at the point end, and the pommel is sharpened into a spear point. So you essentially have a two ended spear with two cross guards. I wish I could have gotten a good picture of this. I mean, it doesn't look like a sword anymore. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. Um, but things were getting very, very unusual at this time. Now, again, want to emphasize that this doesn't mean every sword was like that. We still had long swords. They were still using single-handed swords. They were still using fauchions and pustil and everything like that. But in response to armor, and that's what it drives. It's, a, it's an arms race, right? It's a technology race. In response to the armor, we start seeing some very unique swords and some very, very novel ways of using them to defeat your opponent. Okay, so what changed? What changed? So we have sophisticated fighting systems, heavily armored opponents. We have treatises, we have fighting manuals, teaching people how to use great swords, long swords, pole axes, pole hammers. We have swords like this, and this continues into the Renaissance, all right? We do start to see changes then, but this continues on for quite some time until we get to about the 1600s, um, at which point all this kind of stops, all right? The use of swords declines, the use of armor declines. We no longer see fighting manuals where you would be taught how to use great sword, long sword, and the like. Um, they start to come into the decline. What changed? And if your guess was firearms, you'd be correct. So over on the left-hand side, we have reenactors using what are called fire locks. All right, so these are some of the earliest forms of firearms. Um, instead of a flintlock that would drive a piece of flint against metal to create a spark, these used match cord, right? So these, that's the, the string that you're seeing, all right? So it'd be lit on one end, all right? And that would be put into the pan to ignite the gunpowder. And over the right, um, you see what happens if you try to use your torso to play catch with a cannonball. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. So, and this is what we start, this is what we see. When we get to the point where firearms and gunpowder start to become more dominant on the battlefield, armor just starts to fall away. Um, you to, to wear enough armor to protect you from firearms, you'd have to essentially, you'd essentially be immobile. And as armor became less common, the need for specialized sword techniques became less common. And as firearms became more potent on the battlefield, the need for Bladed weapons became less critical on the battlefield. Now, they didn't just disappear entirely. We know, for example, that into, for example, the Thirty Years' War, uh, Napoleonic era, even into the very, er very early stages of World War I, we did see, for example, armored cavalry. Okay, they were called crossier. And some of them would be very heavily armored, leg protection, helmets, breastplates, gauntlets, the whole bit. Um, but your basic line troops didn't use those, right? If they had armor, they'd have a helmet, maybe a breastplate. Many of them didn't have anything at all. And swords were kind of becoming more of a secondary weapon um, to use in the, in, the, in the 
in the thick of, of melee when the lines would come in contact with each other. So this is basically right, this is basically cover swords through the Middle Ages and again into the early Renaissance. It was a spectacular period of some really, really interesting weapons and armor evolution, some very, very fascinating techniques. Um, there are a number of groups uh, around the world that actively study these period fighting manuals and attempt to figure out how they were, how, how you would be taught if you were a, uh, a soldier, a man, arms, a knight during this period. Um, but by the time you get to the gunpowder, things, things will start to fade away. All right. Well, I apologize. It took a little bit less time than I thought it was going to, but I, uh, I certainly hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting and, and, um, and uh, enjoy what I had to talk about. Yeah, no, no worries, uh, Gavin. That was good. You went, you went 30 minutes. That's no, no worries. Uh, so folks, if you have any comments or questions, uh, now's the time. Uh, if you um, have any comments, please get them into the chat. And if you have any questions, please get them into the Q and A. Um, so Diane asks, uh, thinking about the repeated hits to the helmet, is there anything in the historical records about fighter fighters suffering from concussions like we see in football players today? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now you would typically wear some kind of padded padded protection under your helmet to try to minimize the impact. Um, uh, just like you say, but yeah, the general consensus is these guys were basically concussed pretty much their entire fighting life because they were just getting their cans rattled constantly. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was it was absolutely the case. Yeah, in fact, I used to do medieval reenacting with a group called the Society for Creative Anachronism, um, and that group we wore we wore armor, so steel helms, everything like that. We used wooden or rattan weapons. And just from that fighting alone over the years and the control we used and the safety measure we took in, I know I got a couple of concussions doing that because I remember getting my bell rung a few times. Uh, Gavin, just for the visual, if you want to stop sharing your screen, sure. because uh, right now we just see a big black screen uh, and you're, you're real oh, time. There oh, go. there you are. There you are. Okay. Uh, so an anonymous attendee asks, uh, was the, and I'm going to mispronounce some of these words, was the gorget throat protection developed during this period to thwart the technique of thrusting the sword between armor gaps at the neck? I know that later on it was simply used as a uniform decoration. Right, that's exactly right, because the place where your helmet meets the top of your armor, that's a very good gap to exploit. And you even see that in that one picture I showed you where the guy was half sorting it. He had gotten his tip of the blade over the breastplate and was stabbing down, but that's exactly right. Um, first, it was chain mail um, to protect against cuts, um, just the impact to the, to the windpipe, but also the thrust coming in. That's absolutely right. Uh, Jeff asks, uh, when did the French on guard style of sword fighting with thin long swords develop? Great question. Um, so the estoc, it, it, when you looked at that, you might have thought, well, it looks an awful lot like a rapier, just a pure stabbing sword. And that was kind of what eventually gave rise to things like the rapier. Um, I think we start to see those later in the Renaissance period, more as like a personal dueling sword, um, but I'm not exactly sure. Renaissance is not as, um, I'm, I'm not as familiar with swords in that period as well. Uh, Diane asks, was contemporary movies about medieval fighting, have they gotten it right in your opinion? Um, uh, I know this is gonna sound hilarious, but one of the most period, one of the most period accurate examples of medieval fighting I've ever seen was the duel between Arthur and the Black Knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, just the fact that they were wrestling, they were punching each other, throwing the sword. It sounds ridiculous, but there is actually a technique in one of the Italian manuscripts where you can see the guy holding the sword by his pommel, and he's going to launch that thing at um, at someone. Um, that was actually a that was actually a pretty accurate way of of, um, of fighting. But yeah, uh, most of them are a lot of them. 
Yeah, it's kind of hit or miss. It's kind of hit or miss. I definitely find myself watching some of those. It's like, why are you not hanging guard? What is wrong with you? That's the proper, that's how you respond to that kind of attack. Uh, Jeff asks, was it difficult for knights in full armor to relieve themselves? So I'm sorry, in full armor suits mm -hmm. uh, to relieve themselves. Um, no, probably depends on how sanitary, how much you're concerned about things being sanitary. Um, but I mean, having put on and taken off armor, it's, it's, it, it takes, no, it would not have been easy, I would think, I would think, because you've got to get your leg harness off, you've got to get your everything. Uh, yeah, it was probably not something you could do really, really rapidly. Uh, but Sue, I, I'm sure it happened to the spur of the moment more than once. Uh, Sue asks, were swords relegated more to the upper classes? Uh, and she's curious how expensive swords were in the Middle Ages. Mm, that's a good question. I'm not sure about cost. Um, so interestingly, um, so the um, the fou the um, messer that I talked about. Um, so this single edged um, sword with a, a blunted back edge. Um, they were reasonably common, but actually actually blades like that were one of the more common ones because they were easier to easier to make and they were cheaper to make. Um, really really high quality swords with really high quality steel. That's going to be less common. Um, for you know your, your 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 typical person on the street but at the same time our earliest fighting manual the um the 133 man tower manuscript um that's about sword and buckler fighting so a buckler is this is a actually i've got one right here so that's a buckler shield all right got its name because you could buckle it on your belt you know you can't go walking around at night with a, a big tower shield or heater shield or something like that um but you would have that on the same side as your sword. And the idea is that you draw, if someone you know tried to attack you in the street, you draw your sword and pull your buckler out and you'd be ready to um, pray to defend yourself. So as to how common it was and expensive, I'm really not sure. But I mean, you definitely could, you definitely could, you, they weren't just relegated to the upper classes. I'll say that. Uh, Jack and Jim have similar questions. Uh, Jim would like to know what metals were used to make the swords and the armor? Um, steel. Yeah, it was steel. Um, we do see examples of pattern welding, specifically in the Viking swords, where you take multiple types of metal, put them together, heat them, and then pound them, um, pound them together. Um, softer metals in the center for flexibility, harder metals on the edge for more effective, more effective cutting. Um, but yeah, well, early on, early on, it probably would have might have been more iron because I know we pulled chainmail, massive chainmail out of graves, graves, and they are really, really rough. There was rusted into a big lump. Um, but yeah, that would be my that would be my guess. Yeah, and Jack specifically mentions a few metals. Uh steel folded steel stainless steel high carbon yeah stainless and high carbon no they just couldn't get they, they didn't have the technology for that folded steel definitely yeah so folded steel um damasking where you take the steel and you fold it and fold you know, like like with japanese swords yes we we do see examples of that uh, Anne says did people make their own swords or was there a trade in sword making Every a trade in sword making, yeah, you'd have to be a very skilled blacksmith to be able to, um, to be able to make swords, which, um, again, would have would have factored into the price and availability and and so forth. Because it took a lot of skill to be able to work metal in general, but to make a blade that was not too brittle, it wouldn't break, but was strong enough that it wouldn't bend um, when you used it, uh, that took quite a bit of skill. Okay, let's see here. Uh, hopefully, I'm I'm getting this right. So James asks, do you have any comments or observations on the Met Museum of Art's extensive armor collection? Do you know anything about the collection, like how they were acquired? I I don't. I have a book on it. The other collection is amazing, um, but yeah, how all how all that was acquired, I I don't know. Uh, Olivia asks, uh, after med medieval times, did the sword become the sport of fencing? How, yes. how does fence? Yeah. 
Yeah, basically. And, well, and it's interesting too, because if you look in the Middle Ages, fencing was a term used to apply to any kind of armored combat, but later it became applied to, you know, the thin rapier, um, rapier saber swords um, that we see today. Uh, Diane asks, or Diane says, uh, now I'm in the chat, uh, Kevin. Diane mm -hmm. says, I know there are Viking reenactment groups out there. Yeah. Were there any influences on weaponry, weaponry between the Vikings and other Europeans? That's really interesting. Um, they're Viking and contemporary, you know, Anglo-Saxon and, um, and uh, European swords are actually all very, very similar. They had um they had a very um uh length blade shape um sometimes the pommels were a little bit different the length of the cross guard could vary sometimes they were very very narrow just barely um above the width of your fist somewhere much somewhere a bit longer uh and and whether that was due to you know cultural exchange or people just does that was the best way to build the sword at that time? I'm not entirely sure, but this they're very, very similar across those cultures at that time. And you touched on this a little bit, Gavin, but uh, you know, how does a professor of biology and environmental science uh, get interested in swordsmanship? So where, where did where where did this interest come from? God, great question, great question. Um, so I teach human anatomy, and we I, we we have a cadaver lab, and I do cadaver dissections. And I I, I tell my students that uh, my interest in sword fighting is like you can just kind of think of it as you know dissecting with a really big scalpel. Um, but when I was a kid, fascinated by swords, knights, you know, chainmail in particular, I love chainmail armor. Just something about it is just just beautiful. I've I've made quite a bit of it myself. Well, that's some random pieces that I've made and, and the like, jewelry and so forth. And it's just, I, I got lucky. I managed to find uh, reenactment groups close to, where I, close to where I lived and it just kind of continued on. Uh, you know, that, that took care of that bug and I just kind of continued on from there. Great. Uh, during the medieval times, were swords uh, used in Africa, uh, Jeff asks, or did they only use spears? Oh, no, they, they definitely used um, swords as well, um, particularly saber curve type swords that were good for um, fighting on horseback. Uh, but yes, there definitely were swords. So I think that exhausts all the questions. Oh, and the minute I say that, uh, <laughs> Olivia, that's okay. Olivia asks, do you think that the sword played a big role in Western literature, spirit, and culture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about Excalibur, you know, one of the most legendary swords and, you know, just a legendary piece of literature, you know, Beowulf's weapons. Um, yeah, there was something about the sword that has just always captured people's imagination and no matter what culture it is in um and yes that definitely has influenced um influenced literature and kind of you know you know our thoughts about culture and the like yeah i would absolutely say so let's see anonymous attendee were swords used in ancient greece such as alexander the great oh yes Yes, um, they were typically shorter stabbing um, stabbing swords, um, not quite like the Roman gladius, but you know the you know the, um, but yes, the Greek hop like for example Greek hoplites, um, they primarily fought in a phalanx style formation with the round shields and their spears, but they also carried a, they did carry a single handed um, sword for 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 chopping and for for thrusting. Absolutely. So Jeff's familiar with Joan of Arc, and she, uh, he's wondering were there uh, did women commonly use swords in medieval times? Um, that really depends on how commonly women fought. Now, when you get now, if you look at cultures like the Celts and the Vikings, I mean, women fought just as much as the men did and they would absolutely fight with swords if that's what they had uh if that's what they had available to them um as far as more you know more into the middle ages probably not just because not many women fought i mean if women did fought they would often pretend to be boys so because women weren't supposed to fight that's not a legal like thing to do 
And I believe our final question goes to an anonymous attendee. And I think I already know the answer based on uh, what you've shown us and what I see in your background. But an anonymous attendee asks, do you own any swords and where did you get them? Yep. So this is my long sword. Um, I got this one from, it's, oh, I can't remember the name of the company, but there are a number of companies out there that produce really, really excellent, fully functional replicas. I mean, this this thing, when I first got out the first time, I actually cut my hand because I didn't realize how sharp it was. Um, but yes, this is the, this is the that, that, that's the main one I've got because most of my training was in long sword. Um, but I do have a few other fun ones around. It's not a sword, but I've always loved war hammers. <laughs> Something about that just get yeah. So this this was when you're talking about fighting people in full plate harness, this is the kind of weapon that you would use that would just deliver massive, massive um concussive damage. But yeah, I bought this years ago. I can't remember who who made it, but it's really nice, really, really well made. Good spring steel. Good, good. Uh, I'll read you a few comments and then we'll uh, wrap it up. So Teresa says this was very fascinating. Thank you very much. Marion says, excellent presentation with great slides. Marla says, this was very interesting. Thank you. It helped me understand all those British uh, country <laughs> village stories. Excellent. Uh, Diane, uh, let's see. Diane says, fascinating. Thanks so much. Uh, Diane wants to know, did you get a chance to visit the Higgins Armory Museum before they closed? No, I didn't. Uh, that would have been so good. That would and then, yeah. yeah and, and my my favorite comment, uh, Olivia says, thanks so much, very informative and fascinating. And my comment of the day goes to Nancy, who says, I never thought a 77 year old granny would enjoy this subject so much, but I did. And Gavin, uh, she says you were great. Thank I'm you so much. I am that all those comments are wonderful. I'm really, really glad that you enjoyed the presentation and got so much out of it. Um, as you probably got, like I said, this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. And to, to see other people get uh, see other people enjoy it Great. makes it that that makes it all worthwhile. So thank you all very much for listening. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you, Gavin. Great job. And I know you've given this presentation before, but maybe not over Zoom. So uh, you did a great job. Uh, folks, uh, those watching live, look for an email from me later today with a link to the recording, a link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming virtual programs. So thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Gavin. You bet, Robert. Great, uh, great. Uh, thanks for reaching out and getting in touch with me. Absolutely glad to do this and would love to do it again. Wonderful. Will do. Excellent. Have a good one. You do. Bye-bye.